Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, David asked me this morning, am I going to talk about this whole booklet that you have in front he of you? nervously. And he was very nervous. And I said, no, uh, this booklet is just for you to take away. Uh, I will have a talk this afternoon talking more about the environmental aspects of the oil sands. But this morning, I wanted to take the time to introduce the oil sands to you just to give you a broad picture uh, at a high level of what the oil sands are, what are the key technologies that are being adopt, uh, used in the oil sands, and what the future would look like. So with that, just to say that the oil sands are part of a global heavy oil and bitumen resource. It's a huge resource. Very little of it is actually being produced commercially today. Uh, Canada has the largest of these resources. It happens to be a bitumen resource as opposed to a heavy oil, and I'll explain that. In the U.S., for example, you have uh, several states uh, with heavy oil resources. Of course, California is the granddaddy of them all. They've been producing um, heavy oil uh, for the past, uh, uh, I would say, uh, century. Uh, but most of it, uh, they pioneered steam assist, uh, cyclic steam stimulation back in the 1960s, which we in Alberta adopted, and this was the early technology that was used for producing the oil sands. So the Canadian, uh, I call them bitumen resources to distinguish them with heavy oil, and you'll see the difference when I get into it. Uh, it's, it's huge. It's the largest resource of its kind in the world. Uh, and the reserves, uh, so the resource is what you have in the ground. Reserves is what you can produce economically with today's current technology. This is the current uh, ability to produce that resource. So it's only about 10% of the entire resource itself, and it's the third largest global reserves. Uh, uh, third uh, to uh, Saudi Arabia and Venezuela. The oil sands area is the size of Florida. This gives you an idea of this expansive uh, resource in uh, primarily three locations. The main location is in the Athabasca deposit, but we also have uh, production from Cold Lake and the Peace River deposit. So that entire region is the size of Florida and the land disturbed for mining today is the size of the Kennedy Space Center. Of course, that's growing simply because production is growing. So just to, um, to show you some numbers, I'm not going to dwell on the numbers, but just to say that there is nothing in heavy oil or bitumen, natural bitumen or Athabasca bitumen is what you see here, that's very different from that of conventional crude. Basically, it's just more of the heavies, more of the metals, more of the acid, and so on and so forth. So uh, to put this into perspective, uh, you can see that the viscosity is, uh, is increasing as we go from conventional to natural bitumen, for example. But also, the, um, it's hydrogen deficient as you go to the right. Uh, it's uh, sulfur and nitrogen is increasing the acid is increasing, and the asphaltines and the metal, so the residue in the oil is increasing as you go to the right. But the, um, um, we produce, as I mentioned, a lot of heavy oil already around the world, in Venezuela, in, um, in the U.S., in China, uh, in Russia. We don't really produce a lot of natural bitumen. Um, this, these, this is more of a consolidated material, uh, and it's very different from the material that we have in the Athabasca, uh, in the Athabasca resource as an example that I'm mentioning here. So that difference has translated into commercial opportunities, whereas with natural bitumen, which is a solid rock material with, uh, with very heavy material, is really not commercial uh, in many places in the world. So what has uh, been the reasons for this success and has led 
to, commercial, to the commercial success of the oil sands has been its unique properties. It's unconsolidated sand, so very much like beach sand that has been, if you like, contaminated with, with oil. It's highly permeable, it's, we have thick zones, it's relatively shallow, so the energy required is a lot less, as you will see, and it has a water film around the sand, sand grains. What does that mean? It means if you take uh, some of the oil sands and put it in hot water and, st and stir it, the oil will separate to very readily, and the oil will go to the surface, you get relatively clean sand at the bottom, and the clays, which are also present, and you can see here a picture of the uh, microscopic picture of the oil sand, um, which is also, so the clays also present, is the problem because then they get uh, dispersed in the, water, in the water and take a very long time uh, to settle, and we'll talk about that uh, sometime as well. So the oil sands are a combination of sand and clays, bitumen and water in different proportions, and it's a unique resource. But this resource would never have been developed had it not been for the foresight of some visionaries. So these are visionaries with dog, dog, dogged determination, and I want to tell you about one of these visionaries who happened to be from this region. And that was uh, Howard Pugh, of the Pew Foundation that we hear about a lot today. Um, and he exemplified a uh, visionary that despite decades of failed commercial production, this is in the 1960s, uh, he was determined to produce the oil from the oil sands. Why was he a visionary? Simply because he recognized in the 1960s that, that you needed to produce this resort for energy security reasons. So it's been reported that at a board meeting of Sun Oil Company, um, he basically uh, cajoled them to approve the project. Uh, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a nice story. I don't know if it's true or not, reported by an, at an at attendee saying, gentlemen, either you approve the project or I'll handle it myself, but it's a good story anyway. Um, they filed an application uh, for eventually 45,000 barrels a day with the Alberta regulator. And David mentioned the regulation, so we've had a very strong regulation dating back to the 1930s when, uh, 1940s when oil was discovered in Alberta. Uh, at the board meeting of the regulator, he stepped in and, I sa and said, I believe in the future of the project and I'll put my money with no reservation if the permit is granted the regulator granted the permit. He may have wished that he shouldn't have granted it because the great Canadian oil sand project, which started in 1967, produced 2,000 barrels in the first year when the facility itself was designed for 45,000 barrels a day. They could have packed up and left town, uh, but they didn't, they persevered. Uh, it was a lot of learning by doing harsh climate, uh, the uh, equipment failed at every step, uh, they had nothing but trouble, they had uh, even a fire, uh, but they persevered and today the sun of Sun Oil, Suncor Energy, produces about 300,000 barrels a day. It's one of the larger producers, it's one of the two large producers of, uh, of oil and that's about equivalent to what California produces in heavy oil. Uh, today. It's a lot. So looking at the oil sand resource, it's, uh, it's shallow in the, at the east end and it becomes deeper as you go west. And where it's shallow, you can actually mine it in the same way that you mine coal, in the same way that you mine mineral resources and so on. So up to about 75 meters, it's economic to be able to mine it. Uh, when it gets deeper, uh, steam injection has to be used simply because the oil is heavy, and we'll talk about that in a minute. In the intermediate zone, uh, there really is no technology that's commercially used today, but there's a lot of intermediate zone that could be developed when technology catches up uh, with these zones as well. 
So uh, we coined the term uh, technology oil back in 2003. Uh, others have called it uh, dirty oil, ethical oil, and so on. But I like the word technology oil because we were the first in the ground to coin that term. It's in a chapter in a book which the then chair of our board uh, and myself wrote uh, back in 2003. So I'd like to stay with that term to talk a little bit about the surface mining aspects. And I thought I would do that pictorially. Uh, so we start with oil sands. As I mentioned, it's, it's nothing more than sand that has oil thrown in it. What you see in the picture here is um, a pretty rich sand. It's fairly black as opposed to being brown when it's uh, leaner sand. Uh, then the ore body is, uh, is less and you see it much more brown. And so the oil has to be extracted. Uh, hot water is used in that extraction and it, it's cleaned up and you get the bitumen resource. Uh, you can take this bitumen and uh, then upgrade it to produce very much a crude oil that uh, competes against conventional crude. And that's a so-called synthetic crude oil, very light, uh, much less residue than conventional oil. And the technology has changed. Uh, it started with drag lines, very much, very similar to what's used in mining operations. It moved into truck and shovel, and very shortly, within the next couple of years, a lot of these trucks and shovels are going to be automated so that they work uh, remotely, uh, robotically, if you like. Um, but what's unique about this resource was the development of the hydro transport. This uh, started about uh, 12 years ago, where you can actually take the ore body, mix it with water, uh, so you don't need as hot a water as you would in the extraction process, and transport it to the mine face, to the, to the plant, from the mine face to the plant. The beauty of this uh, is that you can actually get separation occurring while it's being transported. So you're transporting the ore body, but it separates uh, as you transport it. And so by the time it gets to the plant, you have saved uh, a vessel or a unit operation of trying to do the uh, primary separation. So that's, that's the uh, latest technology that's been adopted the last tw uh, 12 years. It's also been responsible for the reduction in energy intensity and hence greenhouse gas emissions. The key technology that's been uh, developed for 80% of the resource that's not surface mineable is uh, so-called uh, the steam-assisted gravity drainage, where you have two wells um, drilled uh, at the bottom uh, of the reservoir where the pay zone is. Uh, one well, you inject steam from the other well, and the steam rises to the top. It condenses, takes the bitumen or melts the bitumen, if you like, comes to the bottom well and is produced uh, from the bottom well. It's pumped back into surface from the bottom well where it's, it flows readily simply because you're using hot steam to do that. Uh, so some of the uh, key factors that has created and uh, the ability to do this, it's basically uh, a technology that applies well to the Athabasca type reservoir. It has been tried elsewhere in the world, like China and so on, but does not work all that well. It works in Athabasca because there is uh, obviously no initial mobility of the oil. It also has a low gas content. That's very important um, for this uh, uh, technology to work. Low gas content also, you'll, you'll uh, see in the booklet that I've provided, also means that there are no fugitive emissions or very few fugitive emissions compared to conventional crudes. And so that's one of the advantages of, um, of, of the oil sands. Very f little uh, or no fugitive emissions because of the low gas content. So there, it's very permeable. It's high oil saturation. It has clean channels with good vertical continuity. That means there is no shell breaks in between or not very much. And you can use moderate pressure of steam. The recovery is very high relatively very high and you get very high rates of recovery as well. And the steam oil ratio that you use is, is three, but uh, now on average it's approaching two. And because you can drill from various pads, you can essentially 
uh, to uh, going to um, extend it in many directions, you can minimize uh, disturbance. Uh, so uh, in situ production, which was in 2002 primarily based on cyclic steam stimulation in an imported technology and adapted from California, has grown because of uh, uh, SAG-D technology that was developed in Alberta, the steam-assisted gravity drainage. Uh, and you can see that it's actually the in situ production has tripled uh, over the last 10 years. So that's, uh, that's an incredible. And it's caught up with surface mining. So right now we produce approximately equal amount from surface mining and in situ. Uh, as I mentioned, the deeper formation, the in situ formation is about 80% of the resource. So 20% is surface mining. But 20% of the big number is still a big number. And so you, you see that in the future, both uh, are projected uh, to increase, and this is based on what is already being constructed or what has already been uh, approved. I'm not going to talk very in details about some of the novel in situ recovery technologies. They're designed to use lower energy and water. Um, the two seem to go hand in hand. You use l less energy, you, you're also using less water. So there are a number of these that are commercial or commercially ready. Uh, these are solvent enhancements to thermal recovery. You can uh, improve recovery by about 30 to 40 percent with about the same amount of less water use. And many of these are up and coming. I should mention the laser technology. This is Imperial Oil. David, uh, to my right, is going to uh, speak about some of these technologies. And it is a commercial technology being used in over oh, close to 300 wells uh, as we speak. Some of the others are uh, commercially ready. Some of them are being piloted. Uh, infill wells are also being, uh, have come in to the picture. And um, I'm showing two examples of these infill wells from two different companies. And they actually are also designed to, to decrease the amount of steam that you need. And uh, electrical heating has also come about. Uh, the, there is Harris, the Harris Corporation out of Florida, with their electromagnetic heating. It's really designed to also reduce the amount of energy that you need to produce this. So the electromagnetic uh, heating is very interesting because what you have done is tuned the, the wavelength to heating the oil and not heating the water or the, um, or the rock uh, matrix. So it is an efficient process. It's still at a very early stage of development. But there is an innovation gap here where we need to reduce the cost, increase the effectiveness, and in the case of solvents, uh, to reduce the losses. I mentioned upgrading. Upgrading is a process by which you convert the uh, heavy oil into uh, a crude that can be much more readily uh, get into a refinery. Uh, generally, a conventional crude can get to the refinery directly. Uh, in the case of, um, in the case of uh, heavy oil, you can also upgrade it before it goes to the refinery. Some of the upgrading conversion requirements, you can see that uh, uh, different crudes require, uh, uh, because of their different properties, will require different processing um, requirements. Uh, so processing severity is a measure of the um, amount of heat that you require, but also the length of heat that you require. So the higher the severity, the more heat, the more time that you require to uh, to uh, produce this, and as you go from moderate to difficult to severe, you're increasing the energy intensity. Uh, but you do that for not only Athabasca bitumen, but also for any heavy oil, uh, uh, whether it, uh, it, it comes from uh, Mexico or Venezuela. Uh, there's a number of novel processing technologies that are being looked at. I've mentioned, in, I mentioned them here. Um, uh, these are, and the, uh, the pictures that you see are of, of uh, technologies that are um, uh, uh, being developed, mostly to, de to develop a, uh, a crude that's, uh, that's pipeline ready and also much more refinery ready, so-called field upgrading or partial upgrading. 
so a number of these technologies are shown here. Um, and there is a gap. The gap is we still need some cost-effective partial upgrading technologies that have a high liquid yield and lower greenhouse gas emissions. So a lot of emphasis on reducing greenhouse gas emissions. So that brings me to what I'm going to talk about at lunchtime today, uh, tomorrow, and that is a, what are the key environmental issues and how can we solve these environmental issues. And David, I'm coming to the end of my talk uh, with, with a couple more slides. Just to say that there's a number of environmental issues. These are not so different from any environmental issues associated with oil and gas production. Uh, obviously, greenhouse gas emission, the water use and quality is an important issue. The aquatic ecosystem is important. Biodiversity and the fact that we're um, disturbing the the forest areas um, is important. A lot to do with oil sand tailings, and I'll mention that this afternoon. Uh, land disturbance as well as emissions and air quality. And all of these things are being addressed, and this is just a cartoon showing some of the projects that we have in the ground uh, trying to address some of these things. Of course, I'm going to go in a little bit more detailed at lunchtime to, uh, this, this on some of these issues, but this is just to, a teaser to say uh, stay tuned. You've got m much more information in the booklets on the environmental aspects. So that leads me to my final slide. Uh, just to say that there are a number of organizations uh, that are very much focused on the innovation side uh, and are seeking innovative solution. One of these is COSIA. It's an alliance that has formed uh, two years ago of 13 oil sand companies that are actually willing to share all of their intellectual property. They're focused on waters, they're focused on tailings, land, and greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, an organization that I work very closely with is the Climate Change and Emission Management Corporation. They actually um, uh, have a tax on carbon uh, that is then used as a technology fund to fund new technology. I'm not supposed to call it a, a carbon tax, I'm supposed to call it a carbon levy, but maybe in this audience nobody will report me for having called it uh, a tax. But it is, that's what it is. It's a tax on corporations that uh, emit more than the amount that is uh, their baseline amount, and so they have to put the extra dollars into a levy that is then used for technology, and you can see some of the areas that are covered in this area. Uh, I'm also associated with CanMed Energy. It's a federal government uh, like uh, USDOE and Nettle. They have labs in both, uh, both Edmonton and Ottawa and pilot facilities, and they work on many of the same problems that, uh, and, and do a lot of very good work in the area of oil sands, but also some of the other areas associated with oil and gas and coal production. And lastly, my home organization, uh, it's a provincial innovation agency. We're very focused on energy technologies, but also renewable and emerging technologies and water and environment is a large part of our, uh, of our portfolio. So uh, that's just a, a quick introduction and just to say thank you and to tell you that our main natural resources is the beauty of our Rocky Mountain areas, the Banff and Jasper National Parks are just remarkable and we would really welcome any visitors we have uh, to these treasured uh, natural resources. So thank you for that.